Hello, Mayday family. How are you guys doing today? So, I know it's been a little while, so bear with me. I have been so swamped. Um, but I'm really excited to be back on talking to you guys today. And I have a really exciting topic actually to talk to you guys about. This is actually something that I will be presenting on this week. And then I will also be presenting on this topic next week underneath the, bro the broader umbrella of communication. So um, I have the wonderful opportunity to train others into becoming the best leaders that they could possibly be. So I just thought that I would bring a little bit of that onto my platform for you guys um, and to share, right? So um, from the presentations and the trainings that I will be conducting this week and next week, it, this is just kind of a little snippet of that. Uh, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about this um, just to kind of get a little bit of the flavor or an idea of what it is that people are really talking about when it means, or, or what it is that people are really talking about when they say, uh, when they talk about emotional intelligence, um, or if you hear the term social flexibility, um, and these are things that can also be applied uh, towards yourself as well. So it tends to be pretty handy for your personal life and to accomplish goals that you might have for yourself. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, first things first, um, get the book, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. This book is absolutely amazing because it also comes with a free test inside and no, I'm not being sponsored, sponsored by the book or anything. Um, but I just really love this book because you gain a lot of insight on yourself. You also gain a lot of insight on where you stand as far as your emotional intelligence goes. So take the test, buy the book, take the test, see how it goes. I really highly recommend it. So let's get started. Now, when we talk about emotional intelligence, essentially what we're talking about is the ability to identify and manage our own emotions as well as the emotions of others. Now that's kind of a brief, precise definition, right? And so it sounds simple, but it actually is not. And what happens most of the times is that we think we're doing that, but in reality, we're not. Um, we're either missing the mark entirely when it comes to correctly perceiving how other people are feeling, uh, or we are um, doing a very, just a very poor job of correctly responding to those feelings or finding the correct ways to respond to those feelings. So emotional intelligence is actually something that dives in really deeply into how to correctly manage your own feelings as well as the feelings of others and their thoughts and processes and how to best use that to achieve your goals. Um, again, I recommend the book, read it. Uh, you'll love it, take the test, figure out where you are on the emotional intelligence scale and go from there. Uh, you can put together an action plan from there. But when you see videos, for example, that talk about how to be liked, by other people? How do you get people to like you? How do you, um, how do you succeed in your career? How do you become a leader? Um, all of those things are somewhat vague, right? Um, people don't stop to think about what it truly means to become a leader or to, what does it, what are we actually trying to get at when we're saying, well, we want people to like us. What does that even mean, right? So all of these things, tend to come back for the most part to emotional intelligence as well as social flexibility. Now, when we're talking about emotional intelligence, let me just make the screen a little bit smaller so you guys can see the full picture. I'm actually gonna move it too because you don't wanna see my, you wanna see the information, right? More than anything else. So when we're talking about emotional intelligence, there are um, two main categories that we want to keep in mind. 
that will help us truly break this down. So we want to keep the personal competence category in mind, and we want to keep the social competence category in mind. When we're talking about personal competence, what that truly means at its core is that we are very self-aware of not just how we feel at any given moment, but also self-aware of the triggers that we might have, things that might trigger us. We're very aware of the processes that we typically take to arrive at certain conclusions or certain behavioral responses. We're very self-aware, right? So in the more self-aware that we are, typically the more self-confident we, we will be. Um, and the more aware of our emotions we will be as well. So we have to be really, really high in this particular um, competency aspect. We need to be very self-aware. Now, a lot of times people are self-aware, um, but are missing one of the other um, three categories. Um, and a lot of times you'd be surprised people think they're self-aware, but they're, they're actually not. So some of the best ways to becoming self-aware is not necessarily just um, making the judgment on yourself or thinking about it yourself. Those are good methodologies to use, but it's also asking some of the closest people to you, you know, what you're like in certain situations, what they've seen, what they've noticed. And you take that feedback and that's most likely going to be the most accurate feedback as far as what you truly are like. Because when we're looking at it from an internal perspective, um, it could sometimes be skewed. So when we ask other people, the people that are closest to us, like, what are, we, what are we like in this situation? Or what do we tend to be like? What do they notice? Things like that. We become more self-aware um, and we become, as a result, more socially competent as well because we're learning how other people are viewing, how other people view us, essentially. Now, with the personal competence and self-awareness also comes um, self-management. So we not only have to be aware of different aspects of ourselves, and honestly, guys, this could go on, this, this could be a pretty long video if we dive in depth as to what self-awareness entails and all the different aspects. So we're not going to do that for this video, but um, when it comes to self-awareness, essentially, it's not just, it's not enough to just be self-aware of um, how we feel, how we typically tend to manage situations, our preferences, things like that, we also have to be um, able to partake in self-management quite efficiently as well. So with self-management, essentially that, that entails everything that we see here. So getting along well with other people, um, being able to use a sensitivity to another person's feelings, being able to really accurately empathize. So not just empathize, but empathize accurately, uh, depending on the situation, um, to manage those interactions successfully, right? So with that, um, we also want to make sure that we're focusing on the social competence aspect of emotional intelligence. So when it comes to the social competence aspect, we have a social awareness, and this is where most people have the biggest challenge. And particularly with people that I know, that I've met, um, people that I've even dated or um, that I've been around, this is where the biggest challenge comes into play. Because uh, to be honest, this social awareness piece fits in um, when it comes to friendships, it fits in when it comes to relationships, it fits in when it comes to family relationships, everywhere. So when we're socially aware, it's essentially being able to accurately pick up on the atmosphere, the climate in the room, um, being able to um, really understand not just the words that the individuals are saying, but the meaning behind the words. And I know it sounds simple, me saying it, but putting that into practice becomes fairly difficult for a lot of people, for most people. Um, so we don't want to pay, like if someone says, for example, if you're at work and you're a manager and one of your team members that you manage comes to you and says, you know, how, like, 
I mean, what, what is this change? Say you're going through a change, the team is going through a change and uh, the team member comes in and says, what is this change truly going to entail? Or they say something like, um, they say something like, I don't feel like I have um, the equipment necessary to undergo this particular change something like that, right? So then we start, mo what most people would do is then they would start asking questions like, well, what equipment do you have? And what do you feel like, you know, what, you know, do you need Zoom? What do you need? That's where most people would go. But when you're socially competent, uh, what you tend to do is you will learn to read the meaning behind the words. So when that team member is coming to you saying things of that nature, what the true meaning behind the question is, is, you know, how am I going to be supported during this change? That's really what they want to know. What they want to know is how are you going to support me through this change, you know, so that I can be successful? Because at the end of the day, you know, if we're going through a change, um, you know, equipment or no equipment, we, we could figure all those things out. But if the team member is coming to you, and they kind of seem to have all these concerns, then you're gonna to need to accurately read what the meaning behind those concerns are. And so that's really what they're trying to say. That's what they wanna know is, how am I gonna be cared for during this change to make sure that I'm successful during this change? So being socially competent becomes very, very important, right? Because that also leads to effective relationship management. And what I see or hear some people say, particularly people from maybe perhaps different cultures is, well, I don't feel like I want to change myself. I, why should I change the way that I am? Well, the thing is, you're not trying to change the way that you are, but you're trying to elevate the way that you, the way that you, you operate and you socialize um, within any particular environment that you might be in. You want to be more flexible. You want to be able to connect with more people, right? So that doesn't entail leaving yourself behind. That entails being able to socially adjust, being socially competent. And, um, you know, that's difficult for most people. So uh, if we're socially aware, that leads to increased relationship management, so we're better able to get along with people. We're better able to handle conflict. We're better able to empathize, which is absolutely essential. So I'm going to use the classic example. If someone loses a parent, for example, and they, um, you know, they just lost their mom and they, you know, tell you about it. And then you say, oh, I know exactly how you feel. Is that the right response to something like that? right? Just that, that Typically, that's not the right response to, to a situation like that, right? There's no way you can ever know exactly how someone feels. So typically, you'd want to respond by saying something like, I understand how difficult that could be. Um, and then you could even follow up with, I lost my mom as well, or I've you know, I lost my dad or whatever. Or you could just stop at that statement. I can only imagine how difficult that could be, that that is for you. Because what you're doing by saying, um, oh my God, I know exactly how you feel is you're essentially invalidating their feelings and you're assuming that you know exactly how they feel, which is impossible. You can't know how that particular individual feels, right? Each person is different. So you need to be careful with the wordings that you use. You need to be careful with the things that you say. You just need to be socially aware as well as self-aware. So these things are very hard to apply. They're actually pretty challenging when it comes to application. And I've seen a lot of relationships um, take a turn for the more challenging side because maybe one person might be, might have a higher emotional intelligence scale than the other person, right? Like for example, I myself, I have a tendency to, um, I don't want to say test individuals that I'm with or that I'm dating, but I have a tendency to throw out certain situations just to kind of see how socially flexible those individuals are. So I might say something like, you know, 
you know, I don't really feel like, um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a good example because I, I, I tend to do this and it's a bad, kind of a bad habit because I try not to um, purposely do that to um, people that I'm in a relationship with. But I always want to know that the person that I'm with is competent in all these areas. So for example, if that person is someone that eats three times a day, right? And so we just started dating. So I'm trying to keep up and I'm eating three times a day or whatever. Right. But typically I eat once, maybe twice a day. Right. I'm just using this as, as an example. I'm not trying to give advice on nutrition or anything like that. But um, so I started out, we started out and we both eat three times a day. And so what I would do is after, you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of dates or whatever, I would say something like, if, say we're, maybe we're talking on the phone or something. I would say, like at that point, I would say something like, you know, I just don't really think eating three times a day works for me. I'm going to go to eating just once a day. And I think I'm just going to do that, you know. And you'd be surprised, like, how many people can't deal. Like, if you're not doing the same things exactly the way they're doing it, or whatever, then, you know, you'd be surprised just with the types, the, the, the varied responses you get. But depending on how they respond, you can kind of see how socially flexible, how competent that person is. And ideally, I would want whoever I'm with to say, oh, great, sounds good. If it works for you, great. And not really be bothered by it. But I've gotten people that are bothered by like my choices. Like if I choose, like it shouldn't really bother anyone. Even if I choose to shower three times a week or just four times a week, that shouldn't be anything that bothers your significant other or anyone that you're around. As long as, you know, you don't like stink or something or whatever. It's just, it's a matter of preference, right? Like, so if you throw a situation like that out just to kind of test how this individual will react and i think i do that because of the field i'm in because i am in psychology i'm in mental health and so um <laughs> i you know probably shouldn't be testing people but it's interesting for me to see certain reactions so when i throw things like that out and um they're not able to cope right? I can tell like, you know, they have a lot of complaints and they start saying things like, well, why would you do that? Why don't, why don't you just shower every day? Like, why, like I couldn't do that. And they get really judgmental or why don't you just eat three times a day? I couldn't do that. And they just kind of go on and on. Then you, t you can tell this person is someone that doesn't have very good emotional intelligence. Um, skills. They're, they don't, they don't rank very high on that scale, right? So this is an individual that lacks, in, that lacks um, the emotional intelligence piece and also kind of lacks within, um, as a result, lacks within the social competence and personal competence piece as well. So ladies, guys, Keep that in mind because as you go on, especially if you're in long-term relationships or friendships or family relationships, what you um, truly want is to surround yourself with people that are very accepting of you. Um, they can kind of give you feedback in a constructive way uh, without judging you necessarily or without feeling like they have to change you at your core, right? So kind of put these tests in place for yourself, but also for the people that you surround yourself with. So next, let's talk about social flexibility. I'm gonna move this little screen right here so we can kind of take a look a little bit more at what we're talking about. So social flexibility pertains to the ability to adapt to different situations, especially um, when it comes to trying to achieve any goals that we might have. So, it's essential, you know. Um, I think the last relationship I was in, he, I, he said something to the effect of, uh, "Well, I don't want to have to change" or something like that. So, you know, you can always 
people, you know, um, it, it's up to you, like what your preference is, right? Like, because social flexibility, unless you're not self-aware of who you are, that, you know, that, that, those type of comments, I don't really want to have to change. That tells me that, you know, this particular individual isn't very self-aware of who they are. They're not very conscious of um, who they are. And not only that, they're not very secure in who they are because social flexibility is the ability to be flexible. That's really all it is. It's the ability to be flexible in different situations, depending on who it is that you're dealing with. That's it. It doesn't call for um, changing who you are at your core. It doesn't, call, it doesn't call for changing who you are personality wise. If anything, it calls for elevating you know, your skill set and elevating you as a person and as a human being. Because as we all know, humans are social creatures. No one lives in a vacuum. So social flexibility is essential. If you move from one country to another country, how are you going to adapt without having the skill set refined, right? Um, if you move from one neighborhood to another neighborhood, if you move from one school to another school, Right, so social flexibility is actually quite essential. You do want to be wary of people that say things like, oh, well, I just want to feel comfortable. Like, I don't want to have to, you know, deal with any of that. You want to be wary of that because, I mean, you want someone that's competent. You don't want someone that is, that is unable to be socially flexible. And that includes anyone, you know, family members, um, uh, uh, friends, relationships in particular. I do a lot of relationship counseling, so you'll hear me talk about that quite a bit in my videos. But um, if you're in a relationship with someone and they say something like that, then you know you might have a little little problem on your hands because um, that person is finding it hard to be um, socially flexible. And what that means essentially, as you can see here, is several things. So um, when we talk about social flexibility, we're looking at flexibility from two aspects, right? Socially and cognitively. So socially is basically the openness to others, being open to others. And cognitively, we're looking at openness to experience as well as how well that individual um, is able to diversify their way of thinking. So when an individual says things like, oh, I just don't wanna do that, I just don't wanna do that, like why should I be uncomfortable around you? Da, 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 da. That's how you know that this person is probably not the best person to be around. Because essentially, you know, they don't have that skill set. they're not on that level, right? And because it's not about changing who you are. If you're self-aware, you don't have to change who you are to have these skills, right? You're, you're able to effectively put these skills into play depending on who it is that you're with and make the relationship work, make compromises based on these things. Um, and be very happy because the person that you're with makes you happy, right? Essentially, that's what it comes down to. But what you start finding is people that don't have this skill set start to become, um, start to complain a lot. They start fights a lot. Um, because they're not, they're just not flexible, you know, and I see that a lot with older people. Younger people a lot um, are able to be a lot more malleable than older people um, tend to be, and that's just factual, you guys, that's just facts, but, um, you know, they start getting, they're, they're a lot more irritable, right, because they're just, you know, you know when you're able to, like, just, like, flex through things, you know, they just don't have that skill set, right, so, um, you know, I'm African and a lot of Africans don't, don't have this skill set. It's not built into the culture. Um, however, I grew up here. I went to school here for the most part. And I, you know, Buenos Aires, Argentina, bilingual, um, all this. So I have a lot of, I just happen to have a lot of diversity infused in me just since I was little, which is the most, which is the prime time, right? As far as being flexible goes. So, um, you know, you, you hear those things and you just know you're kind of talking to someone that is just not, that's missing a lot of core elements, right? So, anywho, moving on, 
these things then lead us to our cognitive flexibility. How flexible is our thinking, our ability to think, which then leads to the behaviors that we choose to respond with. So in our cognitive flexibility, we're looking at three main things. So restructuring knowledge um, in, adaptive, in an adaptive response uh, to changing situations. So essentially what that means is um, what we know, we're able to restructure and malleate depending on the situation. That's really what it comes down to. And a lot of people don't know how to do this. Like, for example, if you were in a relationship previously and now you're in a new relationship, you might find it hard to stop doing the things that you were doing in the last relationship because you're not with that person anymore. Now you're with a completely different person. And this tends to be a very hard point for people. And, you know, I say this because Again, I do a lot of relationship counseling. They get stuck in this and this ruins relationships. So being able to do this, having this ability becomes crucial. Next, finding new solutions to ill-defined or unfamiliar problems. This is the ability to think outside the box. So what worked for one relationship is, is not necessarily gonna work for the next relationship. You gotta get creative. It's like, you know, what do I, what do, I do? Um, and a lot of times, here's a trick, just ask, just ask them, you know what I'm saying? Like, just say, how can we, how, you know, what would make you happy? Do you like chocolates? Do you like, just ask and then do it, you know, just do it. You know, I, I was in a relationship and I had a conversation with this person and I said, you know, why don't you do certain things like buy me chocolate, the flowers, and just like show more affection. And um, the response was not one that I, that, that I would wish on anyone. I mean, the response was just kind of like, whatever, you know, like, what are you even saying? What are you even talking about? Well, that's a rapid um, downhill spiral, right? So there you're seeing kind of like the other person, the other person is just not, there's no respect there and there's just no willingness to contribute to the relationship in um in any substantial way so how can something like that work so you want to be cognizant of that and the easiest way is to ask and then do funny right like so when you know you're having those conversations listening for meaning, right? So if someone says, oh, I like flowers and chocolate, why don't you do those things? Obviously, if you're listening for meaning, then you can tell that this person is probably skewed more towards liking the whole being pampered and um, liking the whole feeling safe, um, having a feeling of safety um, and just having a feeling of being first um, when it comes to um, priorities and when you think about them, just feeling like this person that you're, you think about this person. So there's a lot you can tell just by that. So don't just, my point is don't just fixate on the actual words themselves. Think beyond that. Think creatively, think outside the box, but be correct in your assessment. Don't just like make, make, make things up, right? Um, so I'm just using myself as an example, but yeah, so that's another thing that, I mean, a lot of people struggle with. Um, again, I do this for a living, so, um, I don't, I don't really struggle with these things. What I struggle with is I tend to, um, test others on these things <laughs> when I probably shouldn't be testing people. But anyways, lastly, um, shifting between tasks or mental sets uh, part of executive functions. So basically being able to switch from one thing to another um, without, without difficulty becomes essential as well, right? Like, so if you've been doing something in one way or you've experienced something, um, being able to, um, being able to use that in a way that it teaches you about that experience but not in the way that the experience controls your behavioral responses moving forward. Does that make sense? Like for example, 
Say you've been cheated on in your last relationship. What you don't want to do in your new relationship is start checking his phone, checking his email. So because essentially, right, that situation is now controlling your behavioral responses in this new situation. What you do want to do is be aware that people cheat. So essentially what that means is you can't control the actions of others. So have the conversations about how this individual feels about cheating. Has he ever cheated? Ask the questions that you need to ask to get the information that you feel like you need in order to make a more educated decision on whether or not to continue in the relationship or, or just to let it go. But you guys, um, this was a little bit of a longer video than I thought that it was going to be, but I love the content. I'm excited about the content, and so that is why. But I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Um, it's something that I'm always... Uh, you know, excited about, excited to talk about. Um, and yeah, just kind of keep that in mind. I try to do my homework as far as, um, you know, implementing certain strategies to see who the core of the human being is, especially if it's someone that I'm dating. And typically within two months, two months, I can tell. It doesn't take me any more than two months. I've always told my mom that I'll know if I want to marry someone in two months two months. I'll know. And th that doesn't mean I'm going to go marry someone in two months. Actually, you marry someone in two months. I probably, I won't do that, but I will know if this is someone that I want to marry. It's, it, it's only going to take me two months, but that's because I, you know, administer certain things and I, I want to see, you know, what those responses will be because that brings out the core of people and they don't even realize it. So, um, you guys, thank you so much for joining me today. I will have many more videos like these. Well, I, yes. So the future videos will probably be in a similar, similar format. Believe it or not, I made videos on several other topics, but the editing is what gets me. <sighs> Anyways, thank you guys for joining me. I appreciate you. Love you so much. If you haven't subscribed, don't forget to subscribe. If you learned something new, hit the like button and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.